Okay, so so what we have is we want to determine if the following limit exists. And we have the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of xy e to the y over x minus y. And if you plug in, you get 0 over 0, which means all bets are off. So in particular, what we can do is we can start just trying out some different directions and see what happens. So let's look along the x-axis. So I'm going to let x equal t and y equal 0. So let x comma y equal t comma 0. So let's look at the parametric equation of the x-axis, basically. And we need to find out what happens when we take a limit as t goes to 0, because we want to go towards 0, 0. So then what we need to do is take a limit. And let me explain with limits and stuff. we got to do it this way. Limit t approaches 0. And then we're going to plug in. When we plug in, we have x, y, e to the y. Well, y is 0, x is t. So that's just going to be, uh, let's go t, t is x, y is 0, and then e to the 0 is 1, divided by, uh, I think I have to do it this way. Nope, that didn't work either. Make it that way. There we go. So again, we have uh, t times 0 times 1, and then over t minus 0. And remember, you always want to do the simplification before you even take the limit. Notice if we look at this, the numerator is 0, the denominator is t. 0 over t is 0. So that's just 0. Any questions on going along the x-axis first? OK, maybe I'll even write x-axis. OK, I could do the y-axis. But notice if we do the y-axis, you're going to have x, y, e to the y, and that y is just going to be 0. You're going to get 0 again. Does that help us if we get 0 a second time? What do you think? No. No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. Remember that if you get the same thing over and over again, that doesn't tell you the limit exists, and it doesn't tell you the limit doesn't exist. But what I can do is I can try another pretty easy function. How about y equals x? Or in other words, x is t, y is t. So let's look at um, x comma y equal t comma t. And now let's plug that in. And when we plug that in, we're going to get, again, the limit as, actually, let's um, cancel this. And let's copy and paste. It's a lot easier. So now we're going to have t times t times e to the t over t minus t. What does that become? Undefined. Yeah, yeah so it does not exist. Um, it's undefined even before you even plug in t equals 0. And you should always simplify before you plug in t equals 0. The denominator is just 0. The numerator is a function of t that's not identically 0. And in fact, it's not zero as long as t is not zero, which it isn't. It approaches zero. So that's a, I'm going to write D and E. OK, based on this, what's the conclusion? It doesn't exist. Yeah, the limit does not exist.
Any questions at all on this example? Any questions? Okay. All right. Let's do number two. So now let's determine if this limit exists and prove your answer is correct. So we have a limit as x, y goes to zero, zero again. By the way, um, you can usually get away with x, y going to zero, zero. If it doesn't go to zero, zero, you can always do a substitution with the translation and make it go to zero, zero. So it's kind of safe to get used to the zero, zero. Sometimes you don't go to zero, zero, but you can always um, translate. Same thing with first, um, first quarter calculus when you did derivative. But, uh, limit. Okay, and we have 3x cubed minus y to the fourth over x squared plus y squared. And we're plugging in 0, 0 again, just quickly in your head. If you plug in 0, 0, you get 0 divided by 0, which means that we have work to do. Okay. So then we go ahead and we need to, let's take a look at some curves. And how about the x-axis? So if x, y is equal to t comma zero, and let's plug in. So now we had um, three t cubed over t squared. t squared minus zero, so it's just t squared. And what is that limit? Three. Okay, let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. So always simplify. What's t cubed over t squared? Three times t. Yeah, three t. So it's three t. And then three and t now the limit zero, is t plus so zero, zero, what do you get? Zero. Zero. So that limit is zero. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, we can, again, look at the equation. We could do the same thing when t goes um, to zero, but let's say we have x of t, y of t equals, instead of t zero, how about zero t? So I'm just going to copy and paste. Switch around a bit. And let's take a look at what we get. So the numerator is going to be negative t fourth and the denominator will be t squared. A uh, negative t squared. Uh, yeah, t squared. Because that's squared plus y squared. And that simplifies to negative t squared. And as t goes to zero, what do you get? You still get zero. Okay, we could do this all day long. Um, let's just in our head, if we let um, x and y both be t, we get t cubed minus t to the fourth over two t squared. And that still goes to zero. Okay, if you start seeing zero a bunch of times, what should you start thinking? What might be true? That the limit might be real. Huh? Yeah, limit might exist is the right word, though. The limit might exist. Um, uh, real is dangerous because um, the opposite of real is imaginary, and then this limit still exists as an imaginary number. I'm not going there. <laughs> So um, it exist or not exist is what we want to look at it. Um, so what we're going to do now is want to say, well, let's see if we can prove the limit exists. And I told you that for our class, there's only one way we know how to do that. Other than plugging in and getting lucky, we already didn't get lucky. And do you remember the one way to find out to show that a limit exists other than getting lucky? Yeah, convert to polar. So notice 
and this is set up nicely, the denominator is beautiful. Because the denominator is x squared plus y squared, which is r squared. The numerator is a little messy, but we'll be able to handle it. So let's do a limit. As r approaches zero, so now the radius is going to zero because that's what happens when you go to the origin. And we have a fraction. And what we had is we had three x cubed and that becomes three r cubed times the cosine cubed theta. And then we had minus y to the fourth, minus, and if you look at y to the fourth, that's going to be r to the fourth times the sine to the fourth of theta. And the denominator is r squared, x squared plus y squared. That's what makes this so nice. Okay, now is there any simplification we can do? Yeah, we could factor or I even like cancel out the R squared. Okay, on top, uh, on uh, all terms. So this is equal to and the idea here is actually copy and then get rid of all this other stuff and paste it in and the r cubed just becomes an r the r to the fourth becomes r squared any questions on the little simplification i just did any questions on that Okay, now what is that limit as r goes to zero? Zero. Zero. So what have I proven? Limit yeah, exists. limit exists and zero. equals zero. The limit, and I can go over here. Maybe I'll even do it that way. I think I can. So I'm just going to write the limit equals zero. I didn't ask you this, but I wanted to mention this is important. The limit equals zero. If I look at the function, 3x cubed minus y to the fourth over x squared plus y squared. And I asked you the following question. I said, discuss the continuity of this function. What would you say? What would you say if I said discuss the continuity of the function 3x cubed minus y to the fourth over x plus y squared? Well, isn't it not continuous zero zero because the, then the denominator would make it so it doesn't exist? Yeah, exactly. and there's a hole, right? Exactly. It's not. It's not continuous. At the origin, but it is continuous everywhere else. Because the, when you have a rational function of even two variables, the only time you could have a problem is if the denominator is zero and the denominator is only zero at the origin. So this actually is continuous everywhere except the origin. And at the origin, you have a hole. Okay. Any questions at all on on uh, just talk about continuity? I thought about giving you one of those, but I realized that this quiz would get too long. Okay. All right, so now what we want to do is look at number three. Find the largest region in the xy plane in which the following function is continuous. So f of xy equals natural log of x minus y. So the key on this one, now we're looking at continuity, is we want to say, well, when are there problems? That's how I always look at. When is a natural log bad? 
If the uh, input is a negative number. Yeah, the input's a negative, but actually, zero is bad also. Natural log of zero also is bad. So it's bad at anything that's zero or less. So in particular, it's good when the input is positive. But what I can do is I can say we need x minus y to be greater than zero. Any questions on that? So in particular, y needs to be less than x. Okay, we call this a half plane. Because what happens is um, the line y equals x cuts the xy plane into half. And we want y less than x, sometimes we'll call it the lower half plane. Because y is y is a uh, height. Oops, spelled it wrong. So it's a lower half plane, y less than x. Okay, and if you described it in a different way, that's fine. But somewhere you need to tell me that that's the that is the um, region at which the function is continuous. Any questions at all on question three? Any questions? Okay, so that's the quiz. Um, as I mentioned, from now on, and actually from two days ago on, two days ago at this moment. On, uh, we are doing calculus. So we left calculus for a while, now we're completely back. And what we just finished is continuity. So the next thing to talk about is the derivative. So let me share. That guy. So we want to talk about the derivative. Let's just bond with just saying f prime of x. Uh, f prime of x y, sorry. Okay, what's wrong with just saying, well, why don't we just take the derivative f prime of x y? What's the issue? We'd have to implicit differentiate y. Um, no, it's even worse than that. Why is it, why is an independent variable, not a dependent variable. You can't implicitly differentiate. That doesn't work. Y is not a function of x. Z is a function of x and y. Does that make sense? So you can't even do that. You can't even just say implicit. That doesn't work. Okay, it's even worse. So let me show you. I'll just throw a surface. You can even use the one that's got. If you remember when we had if you remember when you did derivatives, when you first learned about them, you looked at them as a slope of the tangent line. Remember that? Well, if I wrote a point on this surface, is there a tangent line? What do you think? Can we even talk about a slope of a tangent line? Uh, yeah, it's just like a vector in 3D space, okay. right? Or... Now the answer is no. <laughs> there is no tangent line. When you have a surface, you know, and here's a picture of a surface, you can all see that, I think. There's no line, there's no curve. You need a curve to have a tangent line, right? If you zoomed into this, and I can do that actually, and zoom in some more, I don't get a line. So there's no way I can just do the slope. Do you see that, how that works? It doesn't work. So we have to, we have to do it differently. And what we're gonna do is the following. Let me uh, refresh. Instead of thinking about the tangent line, we're actually gonna be doing two tangent lines. And one of the nice things about this particular program is it shows you this nice grid system. Do you see that? And what we can do is at any point, we can look at the curve 
in the x direction and we could talk about the tangent line to that curve but the y is just important as x okay there's nothing special about x y is just as important so we also want to look at the curve in the y direction and look at the slope of the tangent line for that curve that is that curve in the y direction. Have I lost anyone on the picture? All right, so now it's time for the big definition. It's kind of one of the most important definitions of the entire quarter, maybe is the most, and that is the following. And uh, just a minute, I'm getting some feedback, so I'm gonna Muting. Okay. Yeah. So if there's background noise, please mute yourself so we don't all have to hear it. Um, so the definition is the following. We want to talk about the derivative, but it turns out there isn't a derivative. There's going to be two of focus. So let f of x, y be a function of two variables. OK. Then, and now what I'm going to do is we're going to have this big definition, and there's going to be some notation. And there's two different ways of notating a derivative, okay? Have you heard of that before, by the way? No. Two different ways oh. of notating? Huh? I've never even heard the term notating, actually. Oh, of writing one down, of drawing it, of showing it. There's two, two, different, two different ways of writing it. Oh, notating, that's not a math word, that's English. Um, that's just how you, how you write something. Yeah, yeah, we had it before. Remember, you had the f prime way of doing it, and you also had the df over dx way of doing it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So same idea, there's gonna be two different ways, and it has to do with um, whichever one seems to be more convenient and tell the story better. So one is gonna be the following. Okay, first thing, is just like when you had derivatives before, we, we drew a little fraction. And what I need is not a D. We're going to have this weird symbol. And that symbol is called del. It's called del, and it's del f over del f. So you don't use D, you use del. So one way of notating is del f over del x. Another way of notating it is f sub x. And just like in calculus, you do whichever one is friendlier, OK? There's less writing for f sub x. It's also much easier to type. But it doesn't remind you there's a fraction going on. And we are going to have a fraction. Okay, so um, del f del x equals fx, and just like the regular old derivative, this is going to be a limit. So this is going to be the limit, and I think I can have it there. Yep, it's the limit as h approaches zero. So far, it looks the same, doesn't it? And then we're going to have a fraction. And if you remember, the limit definition of the regular derivative was f of x plus h minus f of h. I sorry, minus f of x all over h as h goes to zero. Well, here we have a function of two variables, and here's the idea: is yes, we have a function of two variables, but we're going to pretend we don't. 
we're going to treat y as a constant and only adjust x. So we're going to write f of x plus h comma y minus f of x comma y all over h. And let's make that bigger. because it's a really important definition. And let's boldface definition. Okay. And I'm going to give you some words on it, which I didn't. The partial derivative of f of xy with respect to x is defined by this guy right here. So this should look pretty familiar. It looks very similar, looks very similar to the definition of the derivative in first quarter calculus. The only difference is the comma y. Okay. Well, let me uh, make that a new line because it's actually a separate thing. But I can do is I can copy and paste this. And I could say, well, you know, let's not play favorites. You know, if you have two children, you don't want to just say, I'm only going to like care about one of them and ignore the other. Instead, you need to, you know, work with them both. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the partial derivative of f of x with respect to y. And then you're going to have del f del y is equal to f sub y which is equal to the limit as h goes to zero, but now it's going to be f of x comma y plus h. So now I'm going to treat x as a constant, and I'm going to move y a little bit. And that's what it gives me. Any questions on these really important definitions? Okay. I think you'll probably agree that the most important definition of first quarter calculus was the definition of the derivative. Do you all agree? Okay, this is this is the most important um, definition of this quarter. So get this one down and understand it. And we're gonna we're gonna use it a lot, but I want to make sure that you all can stare at it for a while. Okay, and as I mentioned, what this says is that you're gonna look at a surface, you're gonna take a point on the surface. And then you're going to just shift x a little bit and keep y constant and see what the z slope is. And that's the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And similarly, if we keep x constant and shift y a little bit and see what the z slope is, then that will be the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Any questions on this? Okay, I want to go back to an application we had before, but now we can look at it a little differently. And let's see if you remember this application. Let's go here a moment. Where is it? Do you mind oh, going back to the definition real quick? Uh-huh. Here it is. And you had a question about the definition? No, I just didn't finish writing it down. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I do want to know, remind you that these are all, um, these are all uh, videos on YouTube. So you'll be able to write down as long as you guys remind me at the beginning. There was one that I forgot about. <laughs> um, so yeah, please remind me because I often forget. But if you remind me, I never forget because you told me. So, um, that's one thing is that if you ever need to go back, you can always go back to it. And I have the playlist for this class. Um, any questions so far? All right, so now I want to go back to an example that we had before, but we're going to look at it differently. Kind of my favorite example. Okay, and what we've got is this is a map. And do you remember what you call this kind of map? Topographical. Yeah, it, the, kind of the, ge the geological that word that we use is topographical. Do you remember what you call it mathematically? Remember that? 
Level contour curves? Map. Yeah, level curves and contour diagram. There's actually two ways of talking about mathematically. It's level curves and it's contour diagram. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so that's what we've got. So now I want to, we looked at it, we understand hopefully because we talked about it already, what it, how to look at it and understand what it represents. Okay, now what I want to do, and by the way, this is only the, this is the first time we're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to this one again. Okay, now what I want to do is let's, let's pretend we're taking a hike. Got it? And let's pretend we're taking a hike to Talak. Anyone gone to Talak before? No one? Okay. Yeah, a couple I, of times. I have, <laughs> yeah. 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 I've probably gone 25 times to Talak, maybe something like that. Because um, I go at least every year, sometimes two or three times. Okay. Um, so in particular, uh, you do the Talak Trailhead. Okay, and there's different ways to get into LAC, but we're going to do the TLAC trailhead. And the TLAC trailhead um, actually starts over here, kind of goes, it goes along, it says Bayview Campground. Do y'all see that near Cascade Lake? Okay. And then what I'm going to do is, I, see, I made a red dot when you're getting close to Granite Lake. And I purposely, just to make it easier to read, I put it on one of the level curves. Okay, so what does it mean at that red dot to talk about the partial derivative of F with respect to X? So it kind of in words, not mathematical words, but in hiking words, right? So you know, if you were talking to a friend who hasn't had calculus, what would, what, how would you explain what the partial derivative with respect to x is? The change in x, the change yeah, the in change horizontal. Like horizontal uh, distance. Keep it, keep it simple. We're talking to, let's say we're talking to an eight-year-old. Wait, way too mathematical. I want to keep it. I want to a real simple way of thinking about this. How fast you're walking, like south or north or I don't know. Okay, it's X. That's a hint. So it's not south and it's not north. Oh. <laughs> it's one of the yeah. others. Yeah. So what what is X? East and west. Yeah, but in particular, it is X will be east. Does that make sense? Because positive X is east. So it says that if you take a step in the eastern direction, okay? So on the map, horizontally to the right, that's east. Then what the partial derivative with respect to x tells you, is it tells you how steep you're gonna be walking if you go due east. Does that make sense to everyone? Because we're saying we're gonna set y to be a constant, that means we're not gonna move north or south at all, we're just gonna go east, and we're going to see what is the slope, which is what is the steepness of that hill due east. Okay. Any questions on that? And in this case, it's actually very close to zero. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but, um, but if you look at the level curve at that point, that level curve is almost vertical. I'm sorry, no, it's not very close to zero. It's actually the opposite. Sorry. Uh, it's actually steep. I got it backwards. So if you look at it, we're, we're actually steep. And if you kind of see how these level curves go, I got to go find the numbers again. You're going to be going steep downhill towards Cascade Lake. Do you see that? So the partial drew respect to X is going to be a very high negative number. What about the partial derivative respect to Y? What does that say in terms of if you were talking to an eight-year-old. How high you go north? Yeah, or how steep, how steep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know, the height gives you what your elevation is. Steep gives you how much you're climbing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what it says is how steep you're going if you take a s one step due north. Okay, so what do you think this partial derivative respect to y is gonna be close to? approximately with a number. Zero. 
yeah, it's close to zero because if you look, the level curve is a north-south level curve. Do you see that at that point? It's not perfectly north-south, but it's pretty close, which means that you're hardly going steep at all at that point. Any questions on this idea? So the partial respect to y is going to be, you know, it might be, say, negative 0 0.02 or something like that, something very close to zero. Um, it is it is slightly downward, but not by much. Okay, whereas the partial respect to x might be negative 12, which means that don't do that because you'll probably fall off the cliff. Does that make sense? Okay, and if you ever hiked in that area, it, it's very steep in that area. Any questions on the idea, kind of on a kind of a real life situation? Okay. Um, by the way, this isn't the only time, the only, it's not the only application of partial derivatives. Well, there are a whole lot more, but I think this is, for me personally, it's the easiest for me to visualize, and I can imagine doing the hike. Maybe you guys don't like hiking, but I love hiking, and, you know, I, steepness is really important when you're hiking. Okay, now let's take a look at something a little less real life, but the same idea. Okay, and I'm not sure if we drew on this. I think you guys have the ability to draw and it messes things up. There's a way to I don't see a way to clear the drawing, but there's probably one. Okay. Um, so in particular, if I have a point, if I have a point, let's say, let's say we're gonna look at the point one comma one. Okay, so we look at this, this is, this is again, this is a contour diagram, and we look at 1 comma 1, and we want the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y of these. So notice the partial derivative with respect to x means that if you move, say, point 1 away, then we are stepping about one contour line over. Do you see that? And I set the, the contour step size to be 0.2. Okay, now it, you can't really see it because they're not labeled, but it turns out it's gonna be positive 0.2 over positive 0.1, and that's Two. So what we can say is the partial derivative with respect to x of this particular um, function at the point one one will be two. Any questions on that? On the other hand, if I step upwards point one, it looks like I'm jumping two of the contour lines. Okay, and it turns out I'm jumping down. You, I know it doesn't show it here, but you can trust me that uh, that's going downwards. So the partial with respect to y will be 0.4 over 0.1 and negative 0.4 over 0.1, which is negative 4. Any questions on how to read the partial derivative from the contour diagram? Any questions on the picture? How do you differentiate between going up and down? Yeah, that's one. That, that's a problem with CalcPlot 3D is it doesn't tell you. What you can do is you can put that in and then create plot. Did it do it? And then you can actually see it. Does that make sense? So if, there, if the numbers are labeled on the contours, then you can tell. If they're not, you need to, you know, you would need to see the full 3D diagram. And good luck trying to draw this by hand. It's never, at least for me, it'll never happen. Maybe you can, but I can't. Any questions on that? So I know it was a good question. How do you tell? And unfortunately, it doesn't show you the values of Z unless you put it in the 3D mode. And then you can see the, the values of Z. And then we can see as X, as x goes up, we go upwards. As y goes up, we go downwards. There's a fact. 
and it goes down in the y as you move across y and it goes up as you move across x. Do you see that? Okay, I wanted to just show you the contour diagram because this is kind of complicated to see. I wanted to focus on the contour diagram. But you really need this to really understand the positive and negative. Any questions at all on the visualization before I move on to computation? Okay, I want to do one by hand because I think it's worth it. So let me go by hand. So let's let, I'm going to do a really easy one because it's by hand. F of x comma y equal about 3x minus 2y. It's 2y. Find f sub x evaluated at three comma four. Any questions on the question? Okay, so I'm gonna do the definition because it's easy enough. So what we can do now is we can say, well, x is three, y is four, Okay, and we want to find f sub x. So I'm going to copy and paste the definition and then plug in what I need to plug in. So first thing, x is 3, y is 4, x is 3, y is 4. Any questions on this? Okay, so now I'm going to do another copy and paste. And what is, if f of xy now is 3x minus 2y, what is f of 3 plus h comma 4? So still 3, 4. Mm, not quite. Let's take a look. What it is is going to be, it's going to be three times, and then three plus um, three plus h. Minus two times four. I mean, I just plug in three plus h for x, and I plug in four for y. And f of 3, 4 is equal to, well, now I can just plug in, that's 3 times 3 minus 2 times 4. What's 3 times 3 minus 2 times 4? One. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, now I can simplify more. And now I work this out. Well, I get 3 times 3 minus 2 times 4 minus 1. What's 3 times 3 minus 2 times 4 minus 1? Zero. Zero. So those go away. And all I'm left with is 3H. So I did tell you I'm, I'm starting, a, I'm doing an easy one. And what is the limit as h goes to zero of 3h over h? Yeah, it's just three. And there's my partial derivative with respect to x of f evaluated at three comma four. So I wanna let you know something. I could have done this without any of the work. Because I can just say, well, I have 3x minus 2y. 
I'm thinking about why is this a constant? So this is like a line. It's just 3x minus a number. The derivative of 3x minus number is just 3. Do y'all see that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here comes the big deal. Again, I didn't want to do a whole lot of these by hand using the definition because it's a lot of writing. Instead, what I can do is I can give you how to, con how to define partial derivative. And I'm going to write, um, we'll do fx, but it doesn't matter. fx, fy. And all you have to do, it's really easy, is imagine y as a number. And then take the derivative like you would for a function of one variable. And this always works. Uh, I'm not gonna prove it. Um, if you wanted, I could show you in office hours, but you can trust me on this always works. So now we could do you know, something much more difficult than the easy example I just showed you. So let's do an example. Okay, and um, maybe I should do the following before I do the example. I'm going to copy and paste. And let's find, let's talk about how do you find the partial derivative of x of y. Any guess what changes? 3x is a number. Yeah, it's the same idea. So you imagine x as a number and then take the derivative like you would do as a function of one variable. And now your variable is y. Okay, so here's an example. Find, I need to be so big. Find, maybe I'll even throw in the old, the other notation to see it. del f over del how about y if f of xy is equal to x squared minus y, y cubed over x plus x e to the x. And I do need this bigger because uh, there we go. Okay, it looks pretty ugly, doesn't it? But this is actually very nice. What makes this nice? What makes this so you can just like quickly in one step do the whole thing? We would just use power rule. Yeah, it's just power rule. That x plus x e to the x is a number. Got it? If x is a number, so is x plus x e to the x a number. Is that clear? So this is very simple. And imagine splitting the numerator. You can always do that. The x, what's the derivative with respect to y of x squared over x plus x e to the x? What is it? If we do the first piece, which is we're splitting the numerator, we're just thinking about x squared over x plus x e to the x. 
What's the derivative respect to y of that? And it's very easy. Can it just be one? It's not one, it's even nicer. It's zero. X is a number, there's no y's. If there's no y's, the derivative is just zero. So all this is, is, let's write this down. We can say that del f del y is equal to, well, the derivative of negative y cubed is negative 3y squared. Actually, I need to make it a point. So now, negative 3y squared. The denominator is still there, but it's just a constant, x plus x e to the x. That's it, I'm done. Okay, because I treated everything else as a constant. Any questions on that? Okay. If I asked you del f del x, would that be just as easy? No. No, not even close. Okay, that would be a miserable problem. You know, you could do it. You'd have to use quotient and product rule and, you know, and go through and do it all. Um, but we don't have to because I didn't ask you that. Any questions at all on this example? Okay, it's not too bad, not too bad. I hope you agree. Okay, can the examples get worse? Of course, but the idea is all, everything you learned in first quarter calculus on how to take a derivative still applies to partial derivatives. There's still a product rule, there's still a chain rule, there's still a quotient rule, there's still a power rule, all that stuff works. Any questions on that? So I know we're not talking about this, but I just can't help but think, is there a similar way to do this with integration? Um, well, let me ask you, when we had to integrate last quarter, did you just take a derivative? <laughs> No, no, it was brutal. Remember that? So I will tell you, it's similarly brutal. <laughs> Sound good? Yeah. Yeah, similarly brutal. You want to hear the good news? Yeah. We don't do it this quarter. All right. Yeah, we don't do it this quarter. We never, we never touch integration when you have multiple variables. The bad news is... Next quarter. Those who... Those who are engineer majors or physics majors or something like that is next quarter you have to do it. But that's next quarter, not this quarter. Okay. By the way, I should mention something. Uh, uh, last night I talked to a foreign language instructor. They've been called, told that they're going to be online in the fall. They have not told me yet, but they've told the foreign language instructors plan on online in the fall. I, I'm hoping, I, I just don't want our dean even talk to me because I don't want to hear that. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. So hopefully we don't have to go online or stay online forever. Uh, because there's a lot to it. Okay. It's integrate it's it's a mo a big part of the next quarter is integration with multiple variables. And that's hard. And even worse, integration with vectors and multiple variables. And we'll deal with that. So but don't worry about it. It's not happening this quarter. All right. What we are doing, though, is derivatives. So let's see if I'm going to give you one to try. I think it's a good try, good, good idea. Let f of x comma y be equal to x e to the x y. And the question is, oh shoot, there we go. Find both 
out. F sub x of xy and f sub y of xy. So I want you to try that out. See if you can do that. It didn't take too long. I mean, there's a little bit of work, but it's not so bad. But you do have to remember the basics for, integrate, for uh, taking derivatives, what you learned first quarter, which is a strong uh, prereq of this class, by the way, first quarter calculus. So I'm going to give you a minute or two, see if you can do that. Okay, let's take a look. All right, let's start with f sub y. All right, so the first thing, if we want f sub y, that means y is a constant. It's kind of like x times e to the pi x or something like that. You know, think of y, y as some funny constant. like. So what rule do you have to use if y is a constant and we have x e to a constant times x? Product. We have to use product rule. So again, you can't forget the product quotient train rule. That's really, 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 really important. So what we can do is we can say f sub x is equal to, well, it's a product rule. Derivative of the first, derivative of x is one times e to the xy. And then plus, the first, which is x, times the derivative of e to the xy. Well, y is a constant, so we have to use what rule to find the derivative of e to the xy? Chain rule? Yep, chain rule. And the derivative of e to the xy, if y is a constant and x is your variable, will be y e to the xy. So it's xy e to the xy. Any questions on that? All right, now we need to find f sub y, because that was the question. And f sub y, now the nice thing is x is a constant. Do we need the product rule? No. No, a constant times e to the xy doesn't need a product rule, or e to the constant times y. But we do need the chain rule still. And the derivative of e to the xy, derivative of xy with respect to y is x. I get x times x, x squared, times e to the xy. There's not a lot of work to show here, but you have to understand what's going on. Any questions? Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about 
what about the next level? So remember when you took first quarter calculus, you talked about the first derivative, but you also talked about the second derivative, right? You had an F double prime, right? So how many second derivatives are there going to be? How many different types of second derivatives are there when we're talking about functions of two variables? What do y'all think? Okay, there's actually four. So let me write them out. There's only kind of four. There's four or three, depending on how you look at it. So let's, but for for now, without knowing the, deep, the kind of deep stuff, you should all say there's four. Because what we're gonna have, and I'm gonna write the notation, we're gonna have F sub, xx, then we'll have f sub xy, and then we'll have f sub yx, and we'll have f sub yy. So what these mean is the first one says f sub xx. It means take the partial with respect to x, see what you get, and then take another partial with respect to x. The second one says take the partial with respect to x, see what you get, and then take the partial with respect to y of what you got. The third one says take the partial derivative with respect to y, see what you get, and then take the partial with respect to x of what you got. And the fourth is take the partial with respect to y, see what you get, and then take the partial with respect to y of what you got. You see why there's four? Okay, and in fact, I'm not gonna do this, but next quarter, we're gonna put all this together in a matrix, but not this quarter. And we're gonna oh. talk about matrices. Okay, this quarter, I'm just gonna say the word and that's all you have to you know, care about. I won't ask you on it. Okay, but you have to know how to do all four of these. So let's do an example. Find all four partial derivatives of f of x comma y is equal to x cubed plus y squared minus x y cubed. Any questions on the question? Is it just um, y cubed at the end or is the x and y together cubed. No, just y cubed at the end. Okay. As it says. Yeah, so it's just as it says. Okay, so to do this, the first thing, and just like in first quarter calculus, if you want to find a second derivative, what do you do first? Find the first derivative. Find the first derivative. So we need to find not the first derivative, but the first derivatives, <laughs> okay? And what we could do is we can write them out, f sub x, okay? And by the way, you could also write this in, um, in the del notation also, that works also. And let's see what that is. Well, x now is a variable, y is a constant. So x cubed's derivative is three x squared. What's the derivative of y squared when you're doing fx? Yeah, it's just zero, it's gone. But we do have a minus, with respect to x of xy cubed will be y cubed. Because that's x times a constant is the constant when you take a derivative. And then we're gonna have f sub y equals And now we do the same idea. Derivative with respect to y of x cubed is zero. The derivative with respect to y of y squared is y. 
and then minus to respect to y of xy cubed is 3xy squared. Okay, so to do these second partial derivatives, we need to do the first ones first. Now let's look at the second partial derivatives. And we have f sub xx equals, well, that says focus on fx and take the partial derivative with respect to x. What is that? Six x. Yeah, 6x. The y cubed goes away, 3x squared just becomes 6x. How about fxy? So now we want to take the 3x squared minus y cubed and take the partial to respect to y. And we get 3y squared. Yeah. Okay, now let's do f sub yx. So that means we're going to take the part, we're going to look at the partial derivative with respect to y and take its partial derivative with respect to x. And what do you get? Negative 3y squared. Okay, and then we're going to do FYY. And what do we get? Supposed to be not too hard. Derivative respect to Y of the FY. What do we get? 2 minus 6XY. Yeah, 2 minus 6xy. Do you notice any coincidences? Uh, f sub xy and f sub yx are the same. Yeah. And here's the thing. This is not a coincidence. This is a theorem. OK, and I'm just going to write let f be nice. So basically, you just have to the right kind of continuity. Um, almost any function you're ever going to look at is nice, by the way. OK, you have to make If you can't take a derivative, then you can't say this because it doesn't make sense. Then f sub xy equals f sub yx. Okay, which is really nice because one is it cut to work, 25% less to do, right? The other is then you don't have to worry about the notation, which is first. If you have fxy, well, is that like function notation where you do the y, then you do the x? Or is that like reading notation where you do the x, then you do the y? And it doesn't matter. It's the same. Do you all agree? So this is actually a good theorem. This is one of these happy theorems. So the mixed partial derivatives are independent of order. Okay, I'm not gonna write this down, but this works for partial derivatives if you have f x x y y. That would be the same as f x y x y. You know, you could take a fourth partial derivative. Is that clear? Again, I'm not gonna do every possible example because this is but the nice thing is the order at which you take partial derivatives doesn't matter. It's a really nice theorem. Okay, and quick, very quickly, I'm gonna say for multiple variables, so for three variable or more variable functions, it looks the same. Let me do an example just so we can. So let's suppose we have f of x comma y comma z. 
is equal to, how about xy minus yz squared plus cosine of xy squared. Find f sub, actually yeah, I'll use another notation so I haven't used it in a little while. So I think it's important to know. So find del f over del z. All right. And my guess, even though I have not yet defined it, I bet you know what to do. What do you think? If we have a three variable function and we want to say find f, of, f sub z or del f del z, what do you think we have to do? Yeah, exactly. You let x and y be numbers, you let z be the variable, and you see what you get. And what do you get? This is an easy one. Negative 2yz. Yeah, you just get negative 2yz. Do you agree that there's nothing really extra when you have more than two variables? Nothing, nothing more to do. Any questions on three variable functions? If, and if you had seven variable functions, you could do the same thing. It, it just works the same way. Any questions? Okay, now application. Okay, and again, I'm not leaving much time because I'm not really gonna do them, I'm just gonna show you them. And these are like the most important applications of all of physics, okay? And if you don't know this stuff, you can't understand the applications, but I wanna warn you, you're not gonna understand the applications anyway, and not because of math, but the physics is too hard. Some of the math is too hard too. But I wanna show you some applications so you get an idea that this isn't just me messing around with some you know, funny functions. Okay, have you heard of this one? The time-dependent Schrodinger equation. You heard of that before? I've heard of the Schrodinger equation, but not time-dependent. Yeah, so time-dependent just means that we're not going to just do an instant in time. We're going to actually watch this particle and see what happens. Do you see that? So that's what that means. Now take a look. This is an equation. Any guess on what kind of equation it is? What the words are for saying, describing the equation? An equation of multiple variables. Yeah, but remember, we have an equation with derivatives in it. If you have an equation and there's derivatives, what do we call it? Differential, differential equation. equation. A differential equation, except it doesn't have all ordinary derivatives. It has a del in it. Do you see that? So it's a partial differential equation. And what you don't know is this capital del. This capital delta thing, this upside down delta, which is capital del, is also a partial derivative. I'm not going to get into the, the math, but it, it's more complicated. And then there's some all, all kinds of cool stuff. This is like, like one of the key equations of all of physics, and it's hard. <laughs> so we're not doing it, but I want to kind of show you that this stuff happens. Let me do another one. And, and you all agree this is something you've heard of before? Like if you talk about electron shells, You've got to understand the stuff to truly understand electron shells instead of just be told. Um, if you want to do any work with them, this is what you have to do. And same thing if you do with particle physics. Okay, here's another one. This is the heat equation. Okay, and it's called the transient solution for the heat equation. Notice it's del squared T over del X squared. By the way, if you have a del x squared on the bottom, that's the same thing as txx. It means take the partial derivative with respect to t twice with respect to x. Plus del squared t over del y squared plus del t squared t over del z squared plus, I'm not going to get into what q dot is, q dot over k equals rho cp k 
times del t over del uh, t, little t. Okay, so this is another partial differential equation. You need the partial derivatives. And basically what this says is that, um, for example, if you're in a room and you open up the window, then how is the heat going to get transferred in your room? So very important in engineering. You got to think about that kind of stuff. Is CP specific heat as well in this? Uh, uh, CP, I think I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Again, uh, that's what you do in physics. All right. You may or may not have heard of this, but this is called Maxwell's equation. Have you heard of those? Anyone have heard of Maxwell's equations? If you haven't, um, I heard the name. I just didn't ever know what it meant. Yeah. Have you heard of electromagnetism? Yes. Yeah. So what these are? These are the equations that relate to electricity and magnetism. And again, the last thing I'm going to be able to do for you guys in the you know two minutes left is explain what they all the details. Um, that you need to take like a full course just to understand them. And again, there is a system or a series of partial differential equations. And by the way, almost all the time when you use partial derivatives, it's partial differential equations you're interested in. All the applications I know of are partial differential equations. Okay. And there's a series of differential equations that relate the electricity and the magnetism. And again, trust me on it. Sound good? Okay, here's the next one. You've heard of Newton's second law, right? I hope right. Hope you've heard of that, right? Newton's law. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay, you've heard of that guy named Albert Einstein? Yeah. All right. Well, if you real Albert said Newton was wrong. <laughs> and this is pretty much the equation that works. And this is the relativistic momentum equation that relates momentum and force and using Einstein's theory of um, relativity. And again, I'm not going to get into it, but that's what this is. And you'll notice that there's all kinds of partial derivatives here, del V over del R. Um, and this happens a lot, by the way, and you saw it in the Schrodinger equation. Um, you've seen R. What is R? In our, in our class, we've talked about it. Uh, radius? It's a radius, okay? Four coordinates. Okay. Um, and these are some. Again, we're out of time. I could give you more and more and more. But I'm telling you, I'd say more than half of all advanced physics uses partial differential equations. So if you don't know partial derivatives, you can't do advanced physics, period. Okay, does that make sense? Do you believe me? Yep. Yeah. But it's not going to happen at LTCC because we're a community college. But when you get into your upper division work, then you're going to start having to deal with this. Okay, I just kind of wanted to kind of show you again, you don't have to understand anything I just said in the last few minutes. You do have to understand what a partial derivative is. Um, so we're out of time, so I'm going to stop the recording.